Hello everyone, welcome to video number three of a phylogeny. And in this video, I'm going to introduce two key concepts. Those are the concepts of homology and homoplasy. So let's dive right in. Now the definition of homology is on the slide for you here. This is the fundamental similarity of a particular structure in different organisms, which is assumed to be due to descent from a common ancestor. Um, so homology is basically, uh, uh, the idea is that this is similarity due to shared ancestry between different groups. So the character's similarities across a group of organisms reflect the evolutionary history of a group. A classic example of this is the vertebrate forelimb. All of the examples here share a common ancestor. These are examples of the tetrapods. And we can see that if we look at their um, bones, the bones that make up the um, forearm, we can link these up between different taxa. And that's the word we would use is we can homologize them between the different groups. So in this case, we can, for example, identify the humerus, the ulna and radius, the carpals and the phalanges in a human, shown here, but also in a dog, and indeed in a bird, and even in a whale where the, um, the limb has become a flipper. So that's an example of the homology of structures. And homology is really important when it comes to phylogenetics, because homology is basically where we get our phylogenetic signal. We can compare this with for example, the wings of a dragonfly, shown on the left here, and a bat, shown on the right here. These serve a very similar purpose, and as a result, they have a number of similarities. They're both quite flat, they're both aerodynamically advanced, because they're good for flying, right? But we know, because these um, organisms are, are very kind of separately, um, distantly related groups, that these wings have evolved separately from each other, and the similarities that we're seeing here reflect their purpose. They are not necessarily homologous structures, that we would say, but rather they're independent innovations to allow powered flight in these two groups. So that is an example of similarities that are not homologous. Let's look at this forelimb example in a bit more detail. So if you um, wish to play along with this slide, um, you can follow this link on the um, the uh, slide here to actually view this as a 3D model in which you can load all of these limbs and look at the colour coding um, of the vertebrate forelimb across a wide range of different groups. But what we can see if we look at this kind of fairly remotely from a distance, not looking at the 3D model in this image, is that even back from our, from humans all of the way back to uh, early fish relatives and fishes themselves, we can homologize the structures that we see in the forelimb. Um, so especially within the tetrapods, there's a common bone structure that we see in this forelimb across the group. But this also, the amount of difference you see on this fine phylogeny here, highlights a weakness in our definition of homology. And many scales is not so much about similarity as it is a common origin. So if we're looking in one safe group of shoes, then actually maybe we're talking about similarities due to origins. But if we're looking across all of the vertebrates, actually a fin doesn't look that much like a forelimb. And therefore, developing a picture of what is homologous to what else is homologous can actually be quite challenging. So that really begs the question, how do we identify homologous structures when they're not necessarily similar in appearance to each other? When we're doing phylogenies at a high level, how do we know what on one animal relates to the same, to the homologous structure on another, even if it's been modified very highly to reflect a mode of life? Well, we can use structural similarities to start off with. All of these structures are bone, they're kind of made of calcium fluoroapatite, and that's a strong indicator um, of a common origin for these structures. They're all made of the same stuff. There are also positional similarities in these structures. They're found on the front half of the body, towards the anterior end of the animal, and in this case the humerus is connected to the ulna, um, the ulna 
to the radius, the radius to the carpals, and the carpals to the phalanges. So you can see there's this common sequence from proximal to distal in terms of these bones. And it's this common structure, these connections, that allow us to look to identify in many cases how seemingly different structures um, may well be homologous. But that's not the only um, kind of weapon in our armory, as it were. We have further tools that we can use to identify homology, and one of these we've actually covered already. So homologies can be identified from developmental biology or looking at ontogeny, the development of an organism. So we covered this in macroevolution. Sometimes it just so happens that juveniles look more similar to each other across diverse groups than do the grown-ups. So then that allows us to identify um, uh, what, um, what structures may be homologous. But we can also look at the development of an individual from an embryo to the adult and use this to work out which structures originate in the same place in the developing embryo. So the, the example of this that we covered in um, macroevolution um, was using evo-devo techniques to homologize, because that's what we were doing even though we didn't use that word, to homologize say a spider's fangs with an insect's antennae. We know that the chelicerae, those are the fangs, are the same segment as the antennae based on um, fluorescent tagging of genes in the developing embryo, and that has allowed us to, across the arthropods, homologize um, different structures to each other. So that's a really, really useful way of identifying homology. We can also use the fossil record to understand homology, and this is an example linked to the previous one, which is the arthropod labrum, or labrum, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Almost all living arthropods possess this labrum, which is a small structure that lies in front of the mouth, and it's generally um, called a labrum, though in different groups it sometimes has slightly different names. This is a kind of a mobile fleshy lobe that possesses its own muscles and its own nerves, and it plays an important role in feeding in most of these animals. Exactly what it is has been and remains a matter of debate. The paper that I'm, I've linked here at the bottom, from which I got this diagram, actually uses the fossil record to suggest a possible identity. This suggests that the labrum is actually a highly modified limb pair that's associated with the first segment of the arthropod head. So this is a segment that in living groups doesn't tend to have um, appendages associated with it. That would make the labrum um, in arthropods, equivalent to the antennae of the onocophrons or the velvet worms, a closely related group of animals to the arthropods, based on the fact that it would represent the limbs of the first segment of the, the, the brain. And this paper makes uh, a case that what happens in the evolution of arthropods is that we do have this limb and associated bits of the brain in early Cambrian arthropods, so arthropods around 500 million years ago, have uh, a limb associated with that first segment, but as the arthropods evolve during the Cambrian period, it looks like this, the red limb here, that's the kind of the, the labral segment, moves backwards as the head um, moves downwards in the arthropods, and arthropods tend, generally tend to have a, a kind of a U-shaped gut, and then uh, approaches its modern position while still being a limb, before then being modified to become a labrum in these groups. It's one of several ideas of the origin of the labrum, but it's one that we can actually build from using fossil records to look at the sequence by which this evolved, therefore making a case for the homology of this fleshy lobe with the limbs um, that are still present in the outgroups of this particular um, group of interest. I wanted to highlight very briefly, and it's not really the topic of this lecture or this course, but this also all works at a molecular level as well. We uh, now can, of course, look into individuals' DNA. And if we take a series of, of nuclear bases and align them, we can demonstrate homology between different positions. In individual sequences, once they're aligned, we can then look for homo uh, which hom base pairs are homologous to each other, and then identify when some have changed. So the, um, base pairs that are not, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, are not consistent across this particular um, part of a histone gene are, are coloured between different organisms, are coloured in a lighter colour here. So we know that these 
um, in this case amino acids, um, which are coded for by base pairs, are actually um, homologous to each other, but they have changed in this particular um, uh, gene here. So that's really, really useful. Um, but also genes themselves can demonstrate homology when they duplicate and diverge. And there are some terms associated with this. So for example, if um, you have two or more different gene genes in the genome of a species, which are similar to suggest they have originated in a duplication, these are called paralogs of each other. If, however, you've got two genes that are so similar that they appear um, to have come from a, a single ancestral gene, but appear in different species, we call those orthologs of each other. Um, whereas a gene that does the same role but is completely unrelated is called an analog. So I just wanted to highlight that this is the kind of um, terminology that we can also use when we're thinking about molecular evolution as well. As with establishing homology, Sometimes, in cases where a character is highly modified, it may not be trivial to tell what that character originally was. Um, this problem is known as character polarity, and it's basically a question of what came first. A classic example of this is which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, there are groups of animals, that, um, of uh, tetrapods I should say, that lay eggs. They have a com condition called oviparity. So in this tree here, you can see that there are oviparous organisms, are the crocodile, and the bird, right? They both lay eggs. But there are also groups that give birth to live young. These are, in this um, example, the mouse and the kangaroo. They are, uh, they exhibit viviparity, they're viviparous. Um, so the question of which one of these came first, it, boil, it boils down to what um, the status was, well, whether it was oviparity or viviparity, at this node on our phylogeny. Now, plotting a phylogeny of just birds, crocodiles, and mice, and kangaroos, this question is very hard to get at. However, we can solve this by adding an outgroup. An outgroup in a phylogeny is a group outside the clade of interest that allows us to establish character polarity. In this case, we could happily add a cheeky salamander. Why the devil not? And if we do this, we can say, well, since a salamander lays eggs, um, this node um, must be uh, one that represents of a parity, and this viviparity must be a, a shared derived characteristic of the mouse and the kangaroo. So in this case, the eggs came first and oviparity is the original condition as opposed to viviparity. So outgroups allow us to um, look at, highlight um, character polarity. Now, as I'm sure you're aware, there's a whole bunch of um, terms associated with um, phylogenies and cladistics. And of course, there are examples of terminology that are used to describe characters on a tree, such as those that we've met already. So I'm going to go through some of these for you now. So a lot of these will be ex demonstrated um, using this tree here, where we've got our paraphyletic group, the reptilia, with the birds here and some outgroups for us there. All lovely, isn't it? Um, just for your um, edification, uh, the birds plus reptile clade, which I've already mentioned, are called the diapsids. So the diapsids are birds plus what we've traditionally thought of as reptiles. They're a nice clade. So a plesiomorphic character is a name that's applied to a character state that is based on features shared by different groups of biological organisms and inherited from a current common ancestor. So plesiomorphic to all of these organisms, say, so the plesiomorphic state for this clade, the diapsids, probably let's go for bones again. Bones are plesiomorphic, because we know the outgroup, elephant has bones. So um, bones are plesiomorphic to this diapsid clade. So this is a um, what we used to call primitive condition. We no longer would use the word primitive. Um, we tend to use uh, the word plesiomorphic instead, because this it ties it into a particular evolutionary scenario. Just so you know, this doesn't come up that often, but uh, the opposite to a plesiomorphy is an apomorphy, um, and it's defined essentially as such. An apomorphic um, feature is one that is derived. So uh, an example they put in this definition here is the long neck of a giraffe. All of its ancestors um, have a short neck, so the apomorphic state is in giraffes to have a long neck. <laughs> 
okay? More importantly, I guess, is um, a comparison um, word that we can talk about, which is autapomorphy. So this is an apomorphy, an apomorphic state that is unique to a particular species or lineage in the group under consideration. So in looking at our tips here, we could look at say the birds and we could say like, okay, sweet, birds have wings. That is an autapomorphy of this particular um, group of organisms there on our um, on this particular choice of different species. That's all great. Possibly the most important term we want to define though is a synapomorphy. Though, so this is a word that is essentially a, a shared derived feature. So it's, it's kind of the bread and butter of understanding of phylogeny. So the definition here is it's applied to apomorphic features that are possessed by two or more taxa in common, i.e. the features are shared derived, um, then that's really important because this can tell us about some something about evolutionary relationships. So for example, I told you that this clade is called the diapsids. The diapsids are based on the fact that they have two ancestral skull openings, these creatures. So this is a group that's defined by having two openings on their skull called temporal fenestrae, if you're interested, but it doesn't matter, just behind the eye, above and below it. That's lost in some, some groups, How, hence me saying it's a uh, it's a, an ancestral state um, in some of these taxa because some of them have lost it again. But nevertheless, we can, for a group like this, define it as being um, uh, as being united by this feature, which we know is secondary lost in some of the taxa. Another example of a synapomorphy, if we had two birds here, would once me more be the wings. With only one bird on here, that's an apomorphy. If we had another bird, a synapomorphy, a shared derived characteristic of the birds as a whole, would be that those two would be sharing wings. So basically we've got words here that mean a derived character, and then we've got um, some bits that we put on the front of the words to say it's either belonging to an individual or belonging to a group of things. And that makes these words actually very useful when we're discussing traits on a phylogeny. So apologies that there were those many, uh, those many, <laughs> You can tell it's a lot of words, can't you? That many long words in this. Now, you may have been sitting here being like, great, Russell, but what do you call it when things aren't homologous? Because you gave me an example of what a homology is not, but there's not a word associated with that. Well, I'm sure you'll be relieved to know that there is a word for something that's not homologous. So when things have a similar structure, because they're used for similar things, but do not share an evolutionary origin, that's what this is, we call that homoplasy. So characters are homoplastic if they have evolved independently. So we can go back to our super handsome little bat and our lovely dragonfly and say that, look, actually, that thing that I told you wasn't homology um, in these wings, they both have wings, that's homoplasy. They've evolved similar characteristics because they both fly in the air. Placing characters on a phylogeny is key to understanding homoplasy. And it, it, for example, in this case, um, if we understand a tree of the animals, we can look at the ancestors of both insects and bats and their closest living relatives um, that don't share wings. And that allows us to say like, okay, brilliant. These wings must have evolved independently. These are independent evolutions of flight. So it's actually that the shape of our animal phylogeny that's telling us this. But we can also use the same properties we use to identify homology that I already listed to demonstrate homoplasy across groups. Um, and basically, the more study we do of these things, the more we are likely to identify what's homologous and homologous, I should say, sorry, and what's homoplastic. So that is homoplasy. And homoplasy results from convergent evolution. I've put a, a definition on the slide for you here. Um, convergent evolution is the development of similar features in a species that are unrelated except through very distant ancestors. And we've actually learned about this already. I just probably didn't call it convergent evolution necessarily when we talked about it. So we learned about this in Evolution 201, say. If you remember my example of sympatric speciation, and if you don't remember what that was, you may want to go and look it up. Um, my example of that was fishes in lakes that repeatedly form the same two colour morphs depending on their ecology. So all of these different colour morphs um, have evolved in, fi in fishes that um, uh, 
are living in different ecologies in individual lakes that share a common ancestor, but they've convergently evolved both that ecology and the associated colouring. An example of convergent evolution. And there are a host of other really cool examples we could use to illustrate this. So for example, echolocation as a way of sensing the world has evolved several times independently. So we could compare, for example, bats and dolphins and whales if we want. So dolphins and whales have uh, evolved um, this in the water and bats have evolved it on land. Brilliant. All is good. And the image that I show you in the middle here is from a, a fantastic paper that I've put uh, here by uh, Wai Lu et al, um, which actually shows that as um, echolocation has evolved convergently amongst these groups, we can see um, similar evolution in the DNA sequences that actually code for a particular protein called prestin in these groups. This is a protein that's expressed in um, mammal outer hair cells, and the authors in this paper report convergent changes in the sequences in bats and dolphins that are thought to confer high frequency sensitivity in the mammalian auditory system. So it looks like not only have these evolved a uh, kind of a behavioral and a morphological feature in common, uh, and they've got the kind of the associated morphology, but actually their DNA reflects that evolution as well, which is a really nice example. Another classic example of homoplasy is the forewing of flying animals, which I've put some examples of pterodactyls, bats, and birds on the right here. Now, we have learned that these are homologous structures, and I think this is thus a really good example of kind of how we can think about things at different levels, because yes, these are all modified forelimbs for flight. So in terms of their, modif their, their forelimbs, they are homologous structures, but actually the details of those structures, how they have been co-opted for flight, many of those are homoplasious. So they're an example of convergent evolution. So as we can see, a bat uses its fingers to support its wing, whereas a bird does not. And a pterodactyl uses just one finger to support its wing. So the wing aspects, the, the winginess, the flat shape, for example, if flat shape was a character, that would be a homoplasious character because it's evolved separately, but in a homologous structure, all of that evolution has happened by modification of the forelimb, but that modification um, has happened in different ways. So I hope that makes kind of this, this homology of a homoplasy um, distinction a bit clearer, but also highlights that it is a nuanced um, consideration. We need to consider kind of the scale of evolution that we're, we're looking at when we're talking about homoplasy and homology. And how strong a force convergent evolution is, is a matter of heavy debate at the moment. It is strong enough though that it makes homoplasy something we should always consider while building, building phylogenetic trees. And in our remaining videos we're going to look at how we formulate characters and how we build those trees. So I'll see you shortly in video number four. Take care.